Mark 5, so let's uh, get our Bibles open to the book of Mark and go to chapter 5. We're going to wrap up the discussion today of the uh, man who was healed of the legion of demons over in Gadara, down here southeast corner of the Sea of Galilee. After the man was healed completely and thoroughly, all the demons were cast out of him and he was in control of his faculties again and his body. What did he do? That's right. He was very thankful to Jesus. He knew that it was Jesus who, who did all of this for him and believed that he was God and Lord. And he sat at Jesus' feet when all the people came out of the city to see what had happened out there on the seacoast. Uh, they saw the man sitting and clothed in front of Jesus, listening to Jesus talk to him. Jesus was telling him who he was and why he did this. And, and the same thing that we know today about God and Jesus. And so he, he wanted to follow Jesus. He wanted to go with him in the boat over to Galilee that day. Uh, he would think that, oh, he, he couldn't live with his family for the last several years as long as he had been possessed. He was like a leper. And uh, so he, uh, you'd think he'd want to go home and, uh, you know, see his relatives again. Don't know how many relatives he had. But anyway, probably had some there in Gadara. And he, instead, he, he puts Jesus first. He loves Jesus so much for what Jesus has done to him, saved him from this terrible demon possession, and eternal hell. And so he wanted to stay with Jesus. He loved him above even his family. And not that he didn't love his family, but he loved Jesus more. And he wanted to go with Jesus. So he, uh, he asked Jesus to go with him in verse 18. And what does Jesus say to him in verse 19? Yeah, yeah, go home, he says in verse 19. Go home. Go to your relatives. Go to your friends. Tell them what I've done for you. Tell them about me so they can also believe in me. He made him immediately into evangelist. The minute he was converted, Jesus says, now you are an evangelist for me, a witness for me. Uh, go tell people what you have experienced from the Lord. That's verse 19. Was the man obedient to Jesus or did he argue with him or say, no, Jesus, I don't want to do that. I want to go with you. Didn't argue a bit with Jesus. He says, Jesus, if that's what you want me to do, I'm going to do it. Because it says in verse 20, and he departed, the, the possessed man departed and began to publish in other words, to tell, uh, as Jesus said in verse 19, he, he went and published, he went and told in Decapolis, not just in Gadara, but in that whole pink region. That's, that whole region is Decapolis. What, a, what an evangelist he became. This Gentile spreading the word of salvation to other Gentiles over in this Roman province of Decapolis, the ten cities. And what did he tell them? Did he tell them, hey, live a good life, uh, do, do, do good to others, give to charity, uh, help your neighbor? Is that what he told him? No, he told them, tell what I've done for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He told them about Jesus. Because telling them to save themselves would do no good. That's impossible. The, we are sinners in the eyes of a holy God. And 
and we must be perfect. And the only way we can get to be perfect is the way Jesus healed this man. Cast the demons out of us. Cast the sin out of us. Uh, make us perfect before God so we have eternal life that God ori originally meant human beings to have. So, yeah, uh, tell them the way of salvation. Tell them about Jesus, who is the Lord, God, has come to save us, are lost, and, and he went and did this. He didn't, he, he, he wasn't just blowing smoke in verse 18. Oh, Jesus, I love you, I want to go with you. You know, and then he went back and did nothing. No, he was, he was, what he said to Jesus, that's what the truth was, he wasn't just talk. So he showed his faith by his deeds. Like we discussed last week in the worship, you'll know them by their fruits. This man had the fruits, as it says in verse 20, and he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. <sighs> True conversion of this man who that morning was possessed of 6,000 demons. Now he is a servant and child of God. Uh, so we, we see that Jesus is Lord because as we discussed last time, Jesus in verse 19 says, tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee. And who, who had done it? Jesus had done it. He's always calling himself God there. And that's what he did then uh, in verse 20. He published in the Coplis how great things Jesus had done for him. Jesus, Lord, Lord Jesus. It's the same thing. Jesus is God. He is the Lord Jehovah. And then we got down to the last part of verse 20, and all men did marvel. And that's where I want to continue on this morning. All men did marvel. What was their reaction? Well, first of all, again, you see that word all. All, all men, all people. Uh, and, and, you know, it said he went and published in Decapolis. He told everybody. Everybody he, that would listen to him. That how great things Jesus had saved him from the devil. And uh, it's, a, it's that whole pink region in the upper right hand part of the map. Well, Gadara is a city. And Decapolis means ten cities. Okay. It was one of the ten cities in that region. Okay. That, that it comes from the Latin, from from the from the Roman, you know, Deca ten. Uh, it was a Roman province. It wasn't a Jewish. It was a Gentile region. And this man was a Gentile. But anyway, uh, he didn't. I don't think go home. When it's all men did marvel, he didn't just do it for a day or two. I think he did it for the rest of his life. I think this was his mission in life now. Well, it's pretty dramatic, wasn't it? I mean, he'd lived for years under the control of these demons, which he hated, and what a witness that would be. I mean, in the Gadara region, he was famous, but he even went out further than that, and I'm sure he did it till the Lord took him home to heaven. Uh, all men, he really went out and did it, telling everyone he could about Jesus. But unfortunately, it doesn't say everybody he talked to did the same thing. It didn't say everybody, all men came to faith in Jesus, did it. Just all men marveled. Well, it's the same thing today. What does marvel mean? It means people thought about it. You know, this is a this is a interesting thing this man's telling us. Uh, uh, let's let's think about this. And they talked about it to one another. Did you hear about that man? Did you hear what happened to him? What do you think of that? They marveled. 
They didn't believe it. They marveled at it. They thought about it. That's the way it is with people today, by and large, when they hear about Jesus. Is, is, is there anybody on earth, you think, today who, who hasn't heard the name Jesus? You think so? What is the most universal holiday, the greatest holiday in the whole year? Christmas. Christ Mass. That's not by accident. This, this is God's doing. Uh, every December, they start talking about on the TV and all the media, they say, how do they celebrate Christmas in China? How do they celebrate Christmas in Russia? How do they celebrate Christmas in India? How do they celebrate Christmas in Africa? They heard of it? Well, I'm not talking about the country itself. I'm talking about the people there. I don't know of any country on earth that doesn't celebrate Christmas in some way. Think of it. That's a marvel, isn't it? I was just on the news the other day that some tribe that's never seen anybody else just themselves would be struck. Uh-huh. So, so there are people out there that, and I, I would, I, I don't know this for a fact, but I would assume they've never heard the name Jesus. Okay. I think it would be very rare, especially with the internet with uh, satellites. So these people are pretty primitive. Pretty primitive, yeah, yeah. But I think it's becoming a real rarity. And, and haven't you told us before the reason why Jesus hasn't come back is because his word hasn't gone out? That's right. And he said when, my, when this gospel has gone to all the world, then the end will come. I think it's close. And I think that's why God has given man electricity and modern communications, cell phones, uh, internet, you know, computers and iPads and all that. And they're everywhere. They're not just in the United States. They're in poor countries. And have you ever, well, here's Daryl with his iPhone. I can look up any verse of the Bible in five seconds in lots of different translations. It's a marvel. God didn't give us that just so that we could uh, have the convenience of having a phone with us all the time. He gave it to us so his word would spread throughout the world rapidly. I think this is a fulfillment of what Jesus said. I want to back up on what I said about it. I said somebody, there, there are people I haven't heard, but, but I think what you were saying before was that last person hasn't come to faith yet. Yes, 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 yes. And if you look back in Genesis and do a study of the first eight chapters of Genesis, it very specifically gives you the age of uh, everybody from Adam and Eve down to Noah, when they were born, when they died. And if you do a study of that and you tack them on end to end, you will find that all of them died before the flood, except Noah, and of course his children. I think that's a listing of all the believers, or at least the, the chief believers down to Noah. And God waited till the last one died, and then he, he uh, brought the flood and destroyed the whole world except Noah and his family. And it says very specifically that Noah preached salvation for 120 years, righteousness. He preached the gospel of the coming Savior for 120 years before the flood. The only thing that stopped him was the flood. So he got the word out. The word was getting out through the believers before the flood, but the word had gotten out. Everyone who had come to faith in it had come to faith. And there goes the world. Same thing with Sodom and Gomorrah later on in Genesis. God didn't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah until he did what? 
he extracted the believers out of there after they had lived there for many, many years and preached the gospel there. Then he got them out. Then he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah out of the sky. The Bible's very specific. It gives us dates, it gives us times, it gives us lifetimes, when people were born, when people died, for a reason. So we can see how God works. Yeah, and it's the same, Jesus said it'll be the same way at the end of the world as it was before the flood. The word's going to get out, the ones who are going to believe it are going to believe it, and then the end will come. And maybe, you know, 300 years ago, people thought, how in the world are we going to get this, the Bible out to the whole world? Because it's a big world. They did the best they could, sending missionaries and so forth. Uh, uh, first, God gave to the world the printing press. Now you could print Bibles, you know, a million times faster than you could copy them by hand, and that helped. But that still wasn't fast enough. Now we got the internet, computers. It's all God's work of getting his word out. So it will go into all the world. It can hit. People, 300 people, years ago, or 200 years, or 100 years ago, people didn't imagine the internet. And how you could go anywhere in the world with these satellites beaming down on you and, and, and have your iPhone work. They didn't imagine that. Well, God did. And so he gave the world this as a tool to spread his word. So the, the prophecy of Jesus would be fulfilled. My word will go into all the world. Then the end will come. And when the last person to believe it believes, that'll be the end. But you can see this progression down through time. First, uh, the word of God was word of mouth. Then it was written down. Then it was copied by hand. Then the printing press. Now the internet. It's all God's work to spread his word of salvation. So that that prophecy of Jesus would be fulfilled, literally. But anyway, here we have this man. He goes out into all the, the region for the rest of his life, and yet the, the word of life, the word of truth, the word of God has gone forth. People are hearing it, and all they do is marvel at it. They think about it. They, they wonder about it. Well, is that true or not? Did this really happen to this man? Uh, is there really a guy named Jesus who really did this for this man? And, you know, they think about it. People hear about Jesus. They celebrate Christmas. They really know what Christmas is supposed to be about, even though they ignore it. And they, they think about these things. They wonder about these things. They marvel at these things. But they don't believe it. Believing it, I mean, they know it. They believe it's true, and then they trust it. They don't get any further than they know it. And even if they believe it's true, they don't trust it. So they, they marvel at it. Well, yeah, well, that was it first. But even as this evangelist then goes out into the region and tells everybody, it doesn't say all men believed, as they marveled. Let's go back to chapter 1 for a moment here in Mark. And here you have another, this is the first exorcism of demons in the book of Mark, if you recall. Verse 23, and there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. Okay, same situation, but apparently only one demon in this man. He's in the synagogue. Uh, verse 24, saying, let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? 
Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee, who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him uh, and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. Now look at 27. All the people in the synagogue, and probably everyone they told about it later on, they were all what? Yeah, they were amazed. That's like they marveled. They were amazed insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, what thing is this? What new doctrine is this? Yeah, that, that's what they do. They, they talk about it. They think about it. They marvel at it. They wonder about it. They're curious about it. But it doesn't say they came to faith. Let's go later on in Mark, back to the end of Mark, chapter 15. Mark 15. Here we have a beginning of Mark 15, the account of Jesus the day he was crucified. And who condemned him to death? Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. He's the only one that could do it. He had the authority to do it. So he did it. So Jesus is uh, brought by the Jewish leaders to Pontius Pilate to condemn him to death, to put him to death. So Jesus is questioned by Pontius Pilate in uh, the first part of Mark 15. You can read all about it there. And um, In verse 4, and Pilate asked Jesus again, saying, Answerest thou nothing? Behold how many things they, the Jewish leaders, witness against thee. But Jesus yet answered nothing, so that Pilate what? He marveled, same word. A lot of people marvel at Jesus, but they don't believe. Did Pontius Pilate believe in Jesus? No. He marveled at Jesus. Yeah, but did, did washing his hands absolve him of his sin? I don't know. Well, of course not. Of course not. Well, but I thought maybe that meant... He could have, he could have loosed Jesus. I thought maybe that meant he, he believed Jesus was a, a true... But he didn't have the faith or the courage of his thinking. Okay. He thought, well, I, I don't think this man's guilty of being a king... I don't think he's guilty of treason or rebellion against the Roman Empire. I don't think he's anything worthy of crucifixion. But that's not faith. He didn't trust in Jesus as God and Savior, or he would have let him go. But it was foreordained of God that Jesus die on a cross. It's prophesied throughout the Old Testament, so it had to happen. But still, Pilate wasn't converted to faith in Jesus. Okay? He marveled, but that's not faith. He thought about it, but that's not faith. A lot of people out there think about Jesus. They've heard the word Jesus. They've heard about some things that he, he did. But they don't believe in him as God, their creator, and their savior, who, who came down to save them from hell. Big difference. And this is the reaction we're going to get most of the time when we go out, as this man did. And we go out and tell other people about Jesus. Don't expect everybody to just be converted. They're going to marvel at what you say. They're going to think about it. But only a few will believe, the Bible says. Many are called, but few are chosen. While we're in Mark 15, I want you to look at another verse. Let's go down to, uh, where, let's see, let's go. Uh, this is after Jesus is dead. He's been taken down from the cross. His dead body is taken down from the cross. Verse 42, let's pick it up there. 
And now when the even was come, because it was the preparation, uh, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. He wanted to bury Jesus. 44, and Pilate what? He marveled if he were already dead. So again, he's, he, he's, he's marveling at Jesus. Most people didn't die that fast from crucifixion. That was so unusual, he, that made him think, whoo, he's dead already? He, he marveled at Jesus. And that's the way most people are. They, they stop with the marveling. They stop with the curiosity. Oh, I'll think about him. They can't help but think about him. Christmas. <laughs> I know most people don't celebrate Jesus at Christmas, but they at least think about it. Now, maybe they don't want to think about it. Maybe they want to ban uh, manger scenes from the public arena. <laughs> but they can't help but still think about it. Even people who are Muslims and people who are uh, Hindus and all kinds of people around the world do something to celebrate at Christmas. Maybe it's just put up a tree. I don't know. But that's, it brings to mind again Christ. Christ Mass. Marvelous thing, Christmas. Okay, so going back to, to this man in Mark 5, he goes all around, probably the rest of his life, all around Decapolis, telling people about Jesus. And the response he gets most of the time, if not all the time, is they just marveled. But did that stop him? The first guy he goes to and says, I, I was demon-possessed, and this man Jesus from Galilee, this Jewish man, he, he just drove those demons out of me, and, I, and he told me that he is God and my Savior from sin. And that, oh, really? Well, that's interesting. Uh, hey, what, let, let's go have dinner together. Did that stop him from telling other people? No, he, he said, all right, if you don't want to believe it, I'll go over here. He wasn't discouraged because all people would do is marvel at what he said. Stop short of coming to faith in Jesus. So who knows how many that marveled at first later came to faith. Maybe many did. We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. But at least he spread the word and people marveled and hopefully some later actually came to faith in, the, in this Jesus that this healed man told them about. Uh, I think this man would have been very willing to talk to anybody about Jesus and what Jesus taught him that day at any time. If anybody showed any interest in going further and talking more about Jesus, what did he teach you? What did he say? I'm, I'm sure he would have been very willing to tell them enough to bring them to faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Uh, so finally, where did he go in 20? He published in Decapolis. He didn't say, hey, I got to carry this message to uh, China. No, Jesus said, you go home and tell your friends. You, know, you don't have to go, you don't have to be a foreign missionary to do this. He just did it where he was. And he didn't ever leave his region. He didn't become a foreign missionary. He just 
told the people around him, where God salted him. So he didn't have to go to a foreign country to spread the word of Jesus. He did not did it right where God had put him. We can be missionaries right where God has put us. He's put us here for a reason. As with this man, every account of every person Jesus has healed from demon possession, which is us, every person that Jesus has converted to faith in him should end up with him being an evangelist. Every person should be like this healed man here. Every Christian. Any questions before we go to the next great miracle of this four miracles in a row? No questions? Okay, we're going to leave this man over there in Decapolis now, spreading the word of God. And Jesus is that later on that day go back across the Sea of Galilee northwest to Capernaum, the capital city of Galilee, there on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. Okay? Because in verse 21, it, it shifts gears. And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side. Okay? So he leaves Gadara, having healed this man and sent him on his missionary journey. He goes back in the boat across to Capernaum. And now we come, you know, there's four great miracles in a row here. First is the calming of the great storm the night before. Then the healing of the Gadaran demoniac. And now we come to this woman. And we see the next two miracles interwoven. It's a miracle within a miracle. First, we're going to be introduced to a man who has a daughter at the point of death coming to Jesus. And in the middle of that account, we have the account of this woman. So these two miracles are intertwined. But the first miracle is the woman with this 12-year issue of blood, and she is going to be healed by Jesus. And then the man, who is a leader of the local synagogue, the local Jewish church, uh, whose daughter is either dead or near death, is going to be raised to life, resurrected by Jesus. Okay, that's what we're coming into now, the last part of Mark 5. So here we have the third and the fourth great miracles performed by Jesus in a row within a space of probably two days. Uh, so all these four are together for a reason because they're all so great. Culminating in the raising of the dead, bringing a dead body back to life, bringing this person back to life after they are dead. That's the greatest miracle of all. So you see how there's a crescendo here. Uh, and yet, you look at all four of these great miracles in a row, man could not do any of them. And it makes it clear, doesn't it? Uh, they're out in the storm, middle of the night, uh, the apostles, the boats, Jesus sleeping in the back of the boat. The great storm arises. These are fishermen, some of them anyway, the apostles. And uh, they're, they make their living being on the, on the water, they go to Jesus and say, we perish. We've done all we can do. We, we can't save ourselves. We're going to sink. We're going to drown. Bam, no more storm. Man could not help that situation. Only God could. 
And he did. Jesus did. Jesus is God. The Gadaren demoniac. It says he was a wild man. He was a crazy man. He had superhuman strength. He could tear chains apart. They had tried to bind him. Man had tried to bind him with chains. And he, they couldn't. Jesus, just like that, heals him. The woman that we're going to see here with the 12 year issue of blood had been to all the physicians. All the physicians had spent all her money and was worse instead of better. Jesus, just like that, heals her. The juxtaposition here is amazing. Man can do nothing. God can do it instantly. In all four cases. Of course, uh, the last case here, the raising of the daughter, uh, Jesus goes with the synagogue ruler to his house, but uh, people come from the house before he gets there and sees him on the way and says, don't bother Jesus anymore. Your daughter has died. In other words, she's beyond man's help now. There's nothing man can do anymore. Jesus says to the man, don't worry about it. I got it, I got it under control. He goes and raises her up. All four cases, things that are impossible for man to do. Jesus does. All four in a row. There's a reason for that. Let's look at these. I'm going to just press this upon you. Go back to chapter 4, verse 41. What did the apostles say to each other after Jesus stopped the storm? Verse 41. They feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? In other words, he's got to be more than just a man. Man can't do this. This is impossible for man. All right, go on to the next one. Chapter 5, verse 3. The Gadaren demoniac who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Okay? Go down to chapter 20, or verse 25. Third miracle. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood 12 years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing better, rather grew worse. Why is God telling us this? To show us the limitations of man. And how Jesus, however, is more than just a mere man. Okay, then finally, let's go down to verse 35 in chapter 5. And and while he yet spake, this... um, well, Jesus had spoken to this uh, synagogue leader. There come from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? In other words, man has do, done all he can do, and, the, and your daughter died anyway. Obviously, this man, Jesus, can't do any more either. So they think. But 36, as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. Believe in him. And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and seeth the tumult, and them that wept and wailed greatly, in mourning over this dead girl. And when he was come in, He saith unto them, Why make ye this ado, and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. Forty, and they laughed him to scorn. Like, well, nothing nothing you can do about it now. She doesn't just sleep, she's dead. 
You can't wake her up. Uh, 40, and they laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel and them that were with him, the apostles, and enter, in, entereth in where the damsel was lying. He took the damsel by, damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha kumai, which is being interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. Now look at 42. And straightway, that means immediately, the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of 12 years, and they were astonished with great astonishment. He raises her up just like she was sleeping. Boop, wake up. Okay. This is, this is God t talking to us. This is the greatest book ever written in the history of the world, by far. This is all true for our learning. Okay, so each of the, these four miracles of Jesus what were a display of him doing what only God can do, culminating in the greatest miracle of all, the raising back to life of a dead person. Thus, being definite proof that Jesus is who? He is God. Has to be. Now, Jesus, if we go to chapter 1, he had displayed his great authority as God by doing what? Not just working miracles, but also teaching. 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 Very important. Teaching is very, very important. Old Testament priests, their main job was to teach. And what was the main job of the people? Learn. <laughs> he had ears to hear, let him hear. Priests were called to teach the word of God, word of the prophets, and the people, their job was to listen, hear, and learn. Jesus was a teacher. He taught thousands of people, great multitudes. Look at chapter 1, verse 22. Mark 1, 22. And they, meaning all these people, in the synagogue there, were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one that had what? And not as the scribes. He taught like who? God. <laughs> they, could, they could sense, this is an ordinary man talking to us. His teaching is far above our scribes, the most learned men we have. And they, they knew this. They sensed it in his teaching. Not just his miracles, but his teaching. Go down to verse 27. And they were all amazed in so much that they questioned among themselves, saying, what thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. They not only marvel at his miracles, they marvel at his teaching. His authority, why, he has to be God. That's authority. Go to chapter 2. Mark 2, as we studied it. Um, Here he heals that man that they, that paralyzed man that brought down through the ceiling in the house there yeah, in Capernaum. And immediately he arose, took the bed, and went forth before them all in so much that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw it on this fashion. Never seen anything like this. When we read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when we study them, this, this is what comes out. First, Jesus teaches. 
and his teaching is far above what everybody else has taught. People who hear him testify to this. And then he works these miracles that only God can do that authenticates the teaching. He's not just talk, he can do it. He doesn't just talk like God, he can do the miracles that only God can do. This is, this is a man, a true man, who is far beyond any man. Far greater than any man. Far greater than their, their high priests, their scribes, their rabbis, their great teachers like Gamaliel. They can't hold a candle to Jesus in their teaching. Now, people marvel at him. They still marvel at him today. He's the greatest person in the history of the world. Whether you trust him as your Lord and Savior or not, you have to admit that. Uh, So Jesus uh, is not just a prophet, you know, like Moses and Isaiah and Daniel, all the other prophets of the Old Testament. He's not, 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 he's not just an apostle like, like Paul and Peter. He's far above them all, this Jesus. Uh, people... You know, it tells us in the Gospels, Jesus turned to his apostles one day and said, who do men say that I am? And the answer, they said, well, some people (coughs) think you're a prophet. (coughs) And that's still true today. A lot of people, they think of Jesus, oh, he's a great teacher in the church, a religious teacher, a prophet. (laughs) But he's so much more than a prophet. He is God himself. He's not just one who God reveals his word to. He is the word of God himself. Okay? (coughs) That's the great authority they're talking about. God did not send an an angel down from heaven to teach us to work miracles, to die for our sins. (coughs) <coughs> he's not an angel. Angels are created beings, as we know. Demons are angels. Angels appear throughout the Bible, good angels, holy angels. He's not an angel. Read the first chapter of Hebrews <coughs> someday. <coughs> and that, that chapter alone says he's not an angel. He's God the Son, second person of the Trinity. He's none other. Jesus is none other than God himself, become also at the same time a true human being descended from Eve, the seed of the woman. Now, he could have just taught this. He could have just told people, I'm God. But that wouldn't prove it. People say a lot of things that aren't true. Where's the proof? And so here in his miracles, like these four big ones here, Jesus not only teaches like God, teaches that he is God, he proves he's God because he does only what God can do. So you put the miracles with the teaching. The miracles are the proof. He didn't just teach that he is God. Instead, here, with these great wonders, he demonstrates before mainly these 12 chosen witnesses, we call the apostles, so that they would witness these things firsthand. They're witnessing all these things. Uh, Now, Peter is one of them, as we just read, who goes, Jesus picks him to go into the room of this dead girl. 
to be a witness of Jesus raising her up. And I believe, and many others over the centuries have believed, that the Gospel of Mark is really the Gospel of Peter, as we've discussed before. So here Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, is just saying what he saw. He was there on all four of these occasions. And that's what the purpose of the apostle is. What What did Jesus say? What did Jesus do? That's the Gospels. We're out of time. I want to get into this more in detail, of course, next time where we start picking up on this woman uh, with the 12-year ailment. Shall we close with a benediction? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with us all. Amen.